Well, I'm uh, very, very uh, honored to introduce our, our headline speaker here, uh, Gabe Brown. He's, uh, he's become a friend of mine over the years. Uh, he's from uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. The family farm is just outside of Bismarck on the east side of town. Uh, it's Brown's Ranch. He's got an amazing story he's going to tell you about that and, and the transitions they've been through over time. The other thing is they've started a direct-to-consumer business called Nourish by Nature, which uh, Gabe will give Paul all the credit for this, and, and Paul's done a great job, his son, in making this happen. And it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing when you take your destiny uh, into your own hands instead of relying on someone else to do it for you. So I'm looking forward to what he has to share with us about those things. But I gotta admit, I've, you know, every once in a while you're sitting in on a conference, and I've been to those conferences where you sit there for three days, and you're three days in and you're wondering, what did I get out of this? And uh, it was one of those things that uh, Gabe was, uh, I had to hear things twice, you know, I'm not as fast as a lot of you guys here and, and gals in the audience. And I'd heard him at National No-Till Conference three years ago. Then he gave the same presentation a few weeks later at No-Till on the Plains. And I finally got my aha moment on the second time I heard it. And I took this picture. Now you're going to wonder, what in the world do I have a picture of two eggs and a skillet for as my aha moment? So if you look at that, do you notice there's a little bit of a difference between those two different yolks? So one of those, he had a film crew out documenting what they do at their ranch, and one of them, they, he said, go to the store, you pick out any egg you want in, in the display case. It can be organic, it can be pasture-raised, it can be whatever you want. And then we'll put one of our eggs in the pan next to it for breakfast and see which one you want to eat. I think the story goes. I could be getting it wrong, but that's what I remember at least, Gabe. So you can see the vitamin A, E, and the other nutrients that are in the egg on the right came from his farm, and that's a direct correlation to soil health. So if we can raise healthy soil, we can create healthy food. And that's uh, pretty amazing what he's done. So that egg then inspired a little road trip. So, you know, we, we went up to uh, Bismarck, and we also went to Pierce, South Dakota, and met a lot of the leaders in the regenerative ag movement in that corridor there. And this is from uh, Gabe's farm there. And I uh, got to see some cows that uh, move every day and, and live a great life. And as Gabe says, they only have one bad day. And uh, so we got to... <laughs> And then they taste delicious last night, right? <laughs> so anyway, uh, this is uh, his ranch there and what they're doing with uh, management intensive grazing. And what, what, what girl wouldn't want to be out in the field with Gabe Brown uh, two days after her birthday uh, in North Dakota looking at the soil? So Robin was with me, and we, we had a, a great time looking at what he's doing there. So that's, uh, that's soil that's up to 11% organic matter in North Dakota, where you have 30 or 90 days to really grow a crop. You shouldn't be able to do this. So when I saw him present, I thought, this is too good to be true. We have to go check it out for ourselves. So that's why we went. And it's real, folks. That's, that's really exciting to see. Then we were going through seeing his direct market operation. He just pulled out these uh, New York strips and said, here, here's what we do. Look at the marbling on that. 100% grass-fed and finished. Pretty amazing. And he didn't stage it. He just pulled one out of the freezer. So taking all this in mind, I, I took a little selfie of myself when I was, when I was leaving his ranch thinking about everything I had to do. <laughs> and <laughs> that literally is, is in, in my record uh, the, the day after I left. Uh, I had some uh, mental, mental uh, things going on. But right here, I was through, this is when I knew I had to do what I call Project Moo. So that's where we got started with integrated livestock on our farm, and we're learning how we can scale that to help others uh, do that across the country. So anyway, uh, please welcome a farmer, innovator, thinker, leader, and my friend, Gabe Brown. Gabe? Well, thank you, Monty. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, when I left home yesterday morning, it was six below zero. So uh, this to me is like summer. I, I had to call the front desk and ask them to put the air conditioning on last night. A little bit about our operation. Uh, uh, Monty shared with you the first time that I met him, and it was a, a real pleasure getting him to come to our operation. I'm waiting here for the screen to catch up. Here, oh, There we go. Now we're on. This is a photo of our ranch during the summer. And I know when most people think of North Dakota, they don't, they don't think of that. They think of things like this. 
Most people, when they hear the words North Dakota, this is what they think of. And that's not a herd of musk ox. That's 300 of our cow-calf pairs out grazing cover crops at 40 degrees below zero. Now, I have to admit, I felt a little sorry for my son as I sat in the pickup and made him walk out and take this picture, but <laughs> I made sure he made it back. So, so this is what most people think of when they, when they hear the words North Dakota. Now, uh, it is true there are times that the snow does get a little deep there. If you notice, that's over the cattle's back, and it's time we have to start feeding. When, when the snow gets that deep, it's time to put them on bale grazing. So what in the world does Gabe Brown, putting up with these conditions in North Dakota, have in common with each of you wherever your operations are located? What do we have in common? The answer, of course, is soil. And I have the good fortune, I get to travel a lot now. I travel all over the world, and I share with people the journey, and that's all I am, is sharing our story of how our ranch got to be where it is today. But we have soil in common with every operation anywhere around the world where there's production agriculture, dryland production agriculture, I'll say. So the principles I'm going to share with you that I've learned over the past 25 plus years as I've gone on this regenerative agriculture path are principles that can be applied to any operation anywhere in the world. I have the good fortune, I'm on literally hundreds of farms and ranches each year all over the world. And no matter where I go, I can share the principles and they work anywhere. Now the tools that you're gonna use, whether it be equipment, livestock, different cash crops are going to be a bit different, but the principles are going to be the same. So how do I, a little bit of history on our ranch, and then I'm going to explain how I, I got led down this path that we're on now. The ranch we're on was started by my in-laws in 1956, and they farmed it from 1956 to 1991 when my wife and I had the good fortune of purchasing a part of it from them. It's about 2,000 acres of cropland, 2,000 acres of what we call native pasture. I mean, who are we to say it is or isn't? We weren't alive hundreds of years ago. And then there's another approximately 1,000 acres that was once cropland that's been seeded back to perennials. Now, my in-laws, they farmed it, quote unquote, conventionally. Heavy tillage, the use of fertilizers, some pesticides, some fungicides. My father-in-law, I always, I always say he practiced recreational tillage. He bought a disc for his retirement just to go disc for people. He just loved to till the soil. And that's what this land saw before my wife and I purchased it from them. Now, I had the good fortune in 1991 when we purchased that operation, NRCS came out and they did some baseline soils work. And they found that on our cropland, we could only infiltrate a half of an inch of rainfall per hour. Now, we only get about 10 to 11 inches of rainfall per year. Then we get another approximately five inches of moisture from the 75 plus inches of snow we tend to get on the average every year. But a half of an inch per hour isn't very much. And in my environment, it's imperative then to infiltrate all that moisture and then be able to store it for when the plants need it. Now the grazing system, there was three pastures when we brought that, bought that operation. It was season long grazing. Cattle were turned out in the spring calved on grass and then, uh, then uh, uh, grazed on those perennial pastures up until such a time you've finished harvesting the crop and then you may uh, turn them on that cropland just to graze some of that crop aftermath. But they were locked in the corrals and fed hay about six months out of the year. So when I started farming, I grew up in town, I'm a first generation farmer, I had to learn from my father-in-law. And I, I took ag in college, got a couple degrees, and that's how I learned production agriculture. So I practiced this conventional, quote unquote, agriculture for a number of years. You know, I was still summer following, I was still planting monocultures, doing the same thing that my father-in-law did. Then in 1994, I had a good friend of mine in the northern part of North Dakota who was a no-tiller. And he said, Gabe, you need to go no-till in order to save time and moisture. Well, that just made sense to me. 
it just made sense because I could never figure out with my father-in-law, we'd go out in the spring and he'd say, okay, we're going to till this, this field in order to dry it out so we can plant. But then come July, we were praying for rain. That never made sense to me. Now, my friend gave me some other really good advice. He said, if you're going to go no-till, sell all your tillage equipment, then you'll never be tempted to go back. And, you know, I actually had to do that. Being a beginning farmer at the time, I actually sold all my tillage equipment and bought this no-till drill. So our soils have been 100% zero-till since 1994. And that first year was really good. We averaged 58 bushel spring wheat that year, which was, you know, phenomenal yields for that part of uh, North Dakota and at that time. And I thought, boy, this is easy. I also added peas to the rotation in 1994. My father-in-law only grew spring wheat, barley, once in a while oats and flax. That was it. But it never made much sense to me because ab above every acre, there's approximately 34,000 tons of atmospheric nitrogen. Why in the world do I want to write checks for synthetic nitrogen when I can just plant a legume and have that legume, the, the rhizobia attached to that legume, convert that atmospheric nitrogen into forms that are uh, usable by the plant. So we started to add legumes to the rotation in 1994. 1995, I, I diversified a little more. Unfortunately, the day before I was going to start combining, we had, we had 1,200 acres of spring wheat in that year. We had a hailstorm. We lost 100% of our crop to hail. I had no hail insurance. My father-in-law had farmed there 35 years, and he only once had hail damage that was any significant amount. So the idea of taking hail insurance, why would you? It just rarely paid. Well, that was pretty devastating. So after that hail storm occurred in mid-August, I had to figure out, okay, what am I going to do to make, make use of some of those nutrients I'd put into the soil? I went in and seeded this, winter triticale and hairy vetch. And what I was trying to do was just produce some feed for the livestock and scavenge some of that residual nutrients that I had lost in that wheat crop. What I found since then, I was really taking advantage of what, how nature functions. You know, in nature, the legume will, through the rhizobia, take atmospheric nytrogen, convert it, and then through mycorrhizal fungi, it'll transfer that nitrogen to the grass plant, in this case, winter triticale. The winter triticale will take phosphorus out of the soil through mycorrhizal fungi, transfer it to the legume. Legumes are high phosphorus users. So I was just taking advantage of these principles of nature. 1996, I added corn to the rotation. I was trying to diversify because that land, cropland, as long as my father-in-law and I had owned it, had never seen warm season grass on it. So it was up to us then, up to me, to add a warm season grass to the rotation. So I planted corn. Unfortunately, we lost 100% of our crop to hail again. So that was two years in a row. It was pretty devastating. And I learned quickly that a banker is a fellow who lends you his umbrella when the sun is shining, but wants it back the minute it begins to rain, you know? And uh, so my banker was no longer willing to loan us much money. Plus, I had two years of operating debt that I had to pay back. Well, 1997 came along, and in central North Dakota, it was a major drought. Nobody combined an acre in 1997. So we were three years now into zero income from our grain production. Now, we did have some livestock, and, and so we were able to uh, make a little bit of money off them, but... We all know what happens with livestock, especially beef cattle in a drought. You have to find forage for them. So that became a challenge. So my wife and I both took off-farm jobs in order to make ends meet. And things were pretty tough. 1998 came along, and that's an actual photo I took on our ranch. And you can guess what that led to. <laughs> we lost 80% of our crop to hail. And by then, things were really starting to get pretty tough, you know. When you lose four crops in a row, uh, you really learn how to do without. And I tell people that was really, really difficult to live through, but it was absolutely, without a doubt, the best thing that could have happened to us.
For one thing, all my neighbors were sitting there, they were just licking their chops. Because the ironic thing was, four years of natural disaster, I was the only operation in the area that got hit all four years. One other person lost three crops, several lost two crops, but we were the only ones that last all four. So I had neighbors just drooling, thinking they were going to be able to buy my land. Well, I was never, ever going to give up. Now, that fourth year, that hail storm, um, storm came in late June. So that gave me some time. Now realize where I'm at, our last killing frost in the spring is mid-May. First one in the fall is about the 10th of September. So those 120 approximately days, that's our growing season. That's not very long. But since that hailstorm came in June, it gave me an opportunity. I had to grow feed for the livestock. We planted cowpeas and sedan grass. And at that time, I had no idea what a cover crop was. I was simply trying to keep the banker at bay, feed the livestock, and pay the bills. And I literally did not have the money to buy the twine if I was to cut that forage for hay, and then I didn't have the money to buy twine to bale it. So what I simply did was we turned the cattle out on it, late fall, early winter. That was my first foray, so to speak, into winter grazing of livestock. Now think of what happened, four years, four natural disasters, but three of those were hailstorms. And so I had the ability to grow a crop, but then Mother Nature put that crop back down on the soil. Well, what happened? We were growing a tremendous amount of root biomass. We noticed that our organic matter levels were starting to move up. I really, at that time, came to the realization that I had come to accept a degraded resource. You know, organic matter levels when we bought that operation in 1991 on the cropland were 1.7 to 1.9 percent, and that was common in the area. Well, I was starting to see a move up over 2 percent. Well, it was nature that was, through its efficiencies, leading to an increase in organic matter. And I really realized that it was my stewardship or management that had caused the degradation of that. I had come to accept that degraded resource. And as I travel around the country today consulting on different farms and ranches, the thing most often I hear is producers think, well, you don't understand, this is what I got. And that's the way I was back 25 plus years ago. I thought that those soils I had were what I had and I couldn't change them. I really began to realize that what I was seeing was just a lot of symptoms of a degraded resource. And I just listed some of them here. You know, they, they may or may not apply to you, but lack of moisture, poor fertility, compaction, weeds, these are all just symptoms of a greater problem. I really came to the conclusion back then that I was disconnected from the land. I didn't understand what my soils, what my ecosystem, my farm, was trying to tell me. So, even though I had taken a lot of classes in college, I wasn't being taught these natural principles. I really realized that I needed to educate myself. It was at this time that I attended a conference in Bismarck, and there was an old rancher from northern Alberta there. And he told me something that day that stuck with me ever since. He said, if you want to make small changes, change the way you do things. In other words, buy a different piece of equipment, apply a different nutrient package, change to a different crop variety. But if you want to make major changes, you need to change the way you see things. For whatever reason, that resonated with me. And there's not a day goes by that I don't think about this. So one of the things I do when I travel around consulting on operations, I give the, the, the owner of that piece of property, the ability to look at things differently, see things differently. And I was so excited when Monty uh, gave me an invitation to speak here because when Monty and, and Robin came and visited my operation, I could tell Monty was different there. How to, how's that? Different. <laughs> For one thing, realize I get several thousand visitors a year to our ranch. So it's kind of an everyday occurrence during the summer. But there's those individuals who stand out, and they stand out for their ability to see things differently. 
And Monty shared with you up front before he introduced me that he had a paradigm shift that day. And Rod talked about this last night, this paradigm shift we had in ag. So what I'm going to do today is walk you through my story, the paradigm shift that I had. I really believe the greatest roadblock in solving a problem is the human mind. You know, we're stuck. I, how many operations do I go to and, oh, we can't do that here. Well, why not? Oh, we can't do that here. Why not? Because in our mind, wasn't it Henry Ford who said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're correct, right? So how do we improve soil health? The answer is really to mimic a native ecosystem. Look at the way nature functions. When I went through those four years of crop disasters, I spent a lot of time, I found great solace in going out into my native pastures, moving the livestock, and really observing how those pastures function. And there's some things that are just constant in nature that we see no matter where we go. In nature, there's no mechanical or synthetic disturbance. And I put that up there because it's not only tillage, it's the synthetics that can also cause a problem. In nature, there's always armor on the soil surface. That's what those three years of hail taught me. Nature was arming that soil surface. That residue protects that soil. Nature cycles water very efficiently. You know, I often hear people, oh, water's limiting factor, water's limiting factor. That's the reason I went no-till, because I thought water was my limiting factor. Now I have found that isn't so. In nature, there's living plant root networks, and I talked about that briefly with mycorrhizal fungi. Nature is much more collaborative than it is competitive, but we have to allow her to be. Nature cycles nutrients very efficiently, and I'll talk a bit about that coming up. The other thing is, with nature, there's thousands and thousands of years of research and development. How am I going to better that? I just have to be an astute enough steward to be able to observe those principles that are occurring in nature and then apply them to my operation. You know, so often today, when you go buy something new, whether it be a vehicle or an oven, a car, I mean, it doesn't matter. You're going to get an owner's manual, right? But how many owner's manuals are there for the soil? All of us who are farmers and ranchers, did we receive an owner's manual? Now, a friend of mine, John Sticker, wrote this book, A Soil Owner's Manual. I highly recommend it. It's an easy read, but it lays out those five principles. So those five principles that I had to learn the hard way, least amount of mechanical chemical disturbance possible. Look at that native prairie. Here's another picture of it. That's uh, our ranger in the background there. That's now what we consider native prairie. Whether it was all native, I don't know. But in nature, do you see tillage there? You see a bit from the hoof action of animals, but we don't see the complete tillage that is so often occurs in agriculture today. This is my, I mentioned my father-in-law. I used to love to go just go out and disc. That's not conducive to a healthy soil ecosystem. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand there's producers that are organic producers that are going to till, okay, and I consult on many organic operations. We do use some tillage, but the key is to minimize those tillage passes as much as we can. And now we have producers moving into organic no-till, which is really exciting. I really like this picture, and I know many of you have seen it, but it really illustrates the importance of tillage, of lack of tillage and keeping that soil undisturbed. This is a forested area on the left. A farmer took part of that forested area, cleared the trees off, then farmed it with tillage and monoculture soybeans for 17 years. That's the same soil, side by side. Stewardship or management has everything to do with how those soils are. If you look under a microscope, look at the difference. Which of those soils is it going to be able to infiltrate water? Which is going to hold that moisture for when the plants need it? Which is going to be the home for more soil biology, which are key to cycling nutrients? Our stewardship has a direct impact on that. 
so often when I travel, I hear people complaining they're always in a drought. When we till, we put a crust on the soil surface. That crust then prevents water from infiltrating into the soil. Also, as temperatures increase, we're going to negatively affect biology. So that's one of the reasons we've been 100% zero till on our operation since 1994, is because that's the way nature functions. Second principle, armor on the soil surface. Look at that native prairie there. It's completely covered. You know, that's the armor, the skin. We took this photo here in the Central Valley when I was here back in November. That's Ray Archuleta there. How much skin or armor is on that soil? What's protecting that soil from wind erosion, water erosion, evaporation? Ray Archuleta put it best when he made this slide. He says, this soil is naked, hungry, thirsty, and running a fever. Are we doing, as stewards, are we doing what we can to take care of that resource? I don't care if we're talking grain farming or livestock, the same principles apply. Back where I'm from in central North Dakota, if there's above ground biomass, it's going into a bale and we're exporting carbon. That is just as destructive as tillage to that soil. This is a photo, it's a little hard to see here with the lights, but on the left is, well, I can say it because he's not here, my neighbor's property. <laughs> on the right is ours, okay? That neighbor, when I first came to that operation in 1983, those neighbors were running about 400 cow-calf pairs. They would put them out on that large per, uh, native pasture in April, leave them there till late November, early December. Now he's down to well under 100 cow-calf pairs on the same acres because it always looks like that. You could play golf out there and never lose a golf ball. I often wonder what his cows think looking across the fence. So that's our, one of our paddocks on the right that has been grazed once this year. Now this photo was taken in, in late fall tremendous amount of biomass armor protecting that soil surface. This is me planting corn. That's the kind of residue I want to see when I plant. Here's a close-up picture. That, that field there is planted. That's the biomass of a cover crop the fall before that was grazed during the winter. But when we graze it, we specifically do it in a way that we leave more than 50% of the above ground biomass because that's my weed control for the following year. How many weeds are going to germinate through that? Very few. There will be a few, but not many. How much wind erosion am I going to have there? Water erosion, right? That residue does a tremendous job of buffering the heat. And I know you're laughing, how much heat do we get in North Dakota? But we can get warm. We had a tour there one August day. It was about 94 degrees outside. Underneath the residue, the soil temp was 87 degrees. Bare soil was 107 degrees. Does that make much difference? You might not think about it, but look at this. If soil temps are 70 degrees, 100% of that moisture is used for growth of the, for that plant. Once soil temps start to rise, that plant shuts down. As producers, what are we in the business to do? Grow things, right? Our whole income revolves around us growing things. Why would we not want to have the right ecosystem for that plant to put on maximum growth? Once soil temps reach 100 degrees, that plant's shutting down. In that previous picture, we were already 107 degrees on bare soil. That plant's shutting down. It's not growing. Once we start getting higher than that, 130, 140 degrees, we start affecting biological activity. We start killing biology. It's not uncommon at all when we go consult to see bare soils at 150 to 160 degrees. That's not the way nature functions. That same uh, day we had that, that field school, it was 94 degrees out. We took a spade, put it in the soil. We got earthworms right up working near the soil surface because there's the armor there to protect the soil. Okay, who would agree with this statement? The amount of moisture one receives is irrelevant. Boy, I got no takers today, Monty. 
It's true. It is irrelevant. What is relevant is effective moisture. In other words, how much rainfall moisture can we infiltrate into our soils and then store there via the organic matter levels for when the plant needs it? I know many of you have seen this, but I, I got to put it up on all my presentations. So this is a neighbor. That road, Monty's seen it, separates my place from my neighbor's. Every fall, my family and I set up lawn chairs and we watch our neighbor till that low spot. Because <laughs> it's been the same every year, 35 plus years. He'll go in in the spring, he'll get it seeded. Notice the rest of his land is no till, but for some reason, he likes to till that. Spring after it's seeded, we'll get a little rainfall event, and there that'll be, flooded out. Now, Brad, I was going to nominate him for a Ducks Unlimited Award because it's great wildlife habitat there every year. He's got that pond there. In my mind, that's the definition of stupidity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. I can count on two fingers the number of crops he's harvested off that low spot in 35 years, yet every fall he'll go till it. Absolutely doesn't make any sense. So this is a photo I took off the front deck of uh, my house, June 15, 2009. They were forecasting a major rainfall event, which for us usually means about a quarter inch. But, but it started raining at about 5.30 in the evening, and in 22 hours, we ended up with 13.6 inches of rain, Okay, well over a year's worth of rain. Now, Jay Fear, who is the NRCS district conservationist in Burley County at the time, came out the next morning and he took that photo. That's my farmstead in the background, top of the picture there. There's some slope there. It doesn't look like it in this picture, but I'm a little embarrassed, Monty. There is a little bit of bare soil down here in the bottom, but that doesn't look too bad after 13.6 inches of rain. This photo here, Jay took the same day. That's our soils. The same soils where we could only infiltrate a half of an inch of rainfall per hour in 1991. Now, just here two years ago, and Jonathan Lundgren isn't here yet, Jonathan Lundgren brought a team of his grad students up, and they took this photo. This is how fast we can infiltrate an inch of water now. The answer is nine seconds. So we took soil that could only infiltrate a half of an inch of rainfall per hour. Now we can infiltrate an inch in nine seconds. The second inch took 16 seconds, two inches in 25 seconds. Same soils. I did not do anything except to apply those five principles. Okay, third principle is diversity. I just love this photo. This is one of our paddocks native rangeland. I tell people I bought that land there for two reasons. Number one, tremendous amount of diversity. My son for five years taught rangeland management at the local college. He brought his students out to that paddock. In two hours they collected over 140 different species of grasses, forbs, and legumes. That's tremendous diversity. Now the other reason I bought that land is with that amount of rocks I'd never be tempted to till it. Never. <laughs> I cannot tell you enough and explain enough the importance and power of diversity. Where in nature do you find monocultures? Very rarely. Usually only where man put them. The research is out there too. This is some work by Tillman out of the University of Minnesota. Plant biomass on the left axis there. On the bottom is species diversity and there's all this talk now about cover crops. And as I told you when I started down this path I didn't even know what a cover crop was. Now you can't hardly pick up a farm magazine without them talking about cover crops and soil health. And that's a good thing, but what they're really point they're trying to get across is the power of diversity. Look at that. I often get asked, how many species do you need in a mix? Isn't it amazing? As we go from zero up here, I do have a pointer. Look at that. When it doesn't take much. Get to five, six, seven, eight species. Look at that. And then it gradually uh, tapers off. So how many do I want in a mixes? 
I certainly want at least six or seven, if at all possible, because that's how nature functions. Remember what I said? Nature is much more collaborative than it is competitive. The other thing we could look at, more work by Tillman, plant biomass, again, here on the left, functional diversity down below. Now, what's meant by functional diversity? <laughs> Grasses, forbs, legumes. What do you find in native ecosystems? Grasses, forbs, legumes. Isn't that amazing? Remember how I showed? I planted winter treated kale and hairy vetch together. I planted sorghum, sedan grass, and cowpeas together. I got a tremendous increase in production just by doing that. Yet, what are we told time and time again? You gotta have a monoculture, right? Really, is that how nature functions? If we would have been smart enough to look at ecology, ecologists, they knew this. Miguel Altieri from here in California knew this. A key strategy in sustainable agriculture is re to restore functional biodiversity of the agricultural landscape. Biodiversity is what we need to make our farms and ranches more productive. Diversity drives soil health. How did I get soils like that? With diversity not with monocultures. Monocultures are a detriment to soil health. That's proven over and over again. There's no arguing that whatsoever. Yet what do we do in production agriculture? Monocultures, right? Ray Archuleta said it best when he said, plant and soil are one. It's like the chicken and the egg. You can't have one without the other. You need them both. Take a look, I like this photo. This was taken in Australia. That's an old salt bed there. Why is that soil dark on top? What's the reason for that? How about this photo? We've all driven through the mountains and seen this, right? A tree growing out of a rock. Is there a pocket of soil in there? How, do, how does that happen? Photosynthesis. Plants take in CO2 out of the atmosphere. Photosynthesis occurs. It's converted to sugars, amino acids, and all those other compounds. And then part of it is used for growth. Part of it goes down to the root where it's exuded into the soil. That's the root tip of a plant exuding those compounds into the soil. Why does it do that? The answer, of course, is to feed this, to feed biology. Because the way plants get nutrients is from that biology running its life cycle. We need to concentrate on this if we truly want to be profitable in the agricultural business. Now, a large part of those root exudates are consumed by biology. Part of it, though, combines with water, forms a mild form of carbonic acid. That's the, the compound that breaks down that parent material. You know, for years I was told, Gabe, you know, you're going to run out of all these nutrients. No, I'm not, because I have living plants working for me. There's very, very few places in the world that we cannot have profitable production agriculture just from the nutrient cycling of biology. I just really like these pictures. These are some native grass species. That's intermediate wheat grass there. Look at the root mass. How much biology are you going to be able to feed type of root mass? All the photosynthesis occurring, pumping that carbon and those compounds down into the soil to feed biology. Roots feeding biology leads to porosity. How did I take my soils from soils at a half of an inch per hour on up to an inch in nine seconds? I grew things. Simple as that. I grew things. And then it's simply up to nature. The glomalin from the mycorrhizal fungi, the sticky substance, holding those soil particles together, building this type of porosity. The more pore spaces, the greater the infiltration rate, the greater the home for biology. So what have we done on our operation? We've put diversity into the cropping system. Remember how I talked about my father-in-law only grew spring wheat, oats, a little bit of barley and flax. In the upper left, that's cool season grass. That's oats with three types of clover growing underneath it. 
The upper right, that's a cool season broadleaf forage mix, very diverse. Lower left, that's corn with hairy vetch and clover growing in it. Lower right, sunflowers, and there's actually 19 species of cover crops growing underneath those sunflowers. I'm allowing nature to act how it was designed to and how it evolved to. I really think this is going to be the new, one of the new paradigms. Rod talked about paradigms last night. This is one of the new ones. We're starting to see this. They're really doing a lot of it in Canada. We're not planting monocultures. This photo was taken on my operation. I now started growing these five-way mixes. Oats, barley, peas, flax, lentils, all grown together. We're increasing net profit per acre from 20 to 60 percent higher, growing these diverse mixes. It's simply taking advantage of the efficiencies of nature. Fourth principle, living root in the ground as long as possible throughout the year. Look at a native ecosystem. There's always something growing, right? In North Dakota, we, in the spring, we still have snow on the ground. We'll have crocuses poking through the snow. In the, in the early winter, November, December, we still have plants that are green and growing. We have to have a living root in the ground as long as possible. Yet how many of us as producers, once we grow that cash crop, how many of us have an, a living plant in that soil? You have to, if you want to feed mycorrhizal fungi, build soil aggregates, feed biology. There has to be something alive and growing. In the foreground here, this was a field of winter triticale hairy vetch that we combined. Now, we combined that in late August. This photo was taken in early October. We froze 15 or 20 times. I immediately, after I combined, went in there. This is oats, peas, flax, and lentils, and I added two pounds of daikon radish in there. I took that right out of the grain bin, except for the radish, went in and seeded. Why did I do that? Simply to have something green and growing. Now, as long as I got this photo up, I want to point this out. That's sorghum sedan grass there, warm season grass. If it gets near 32 degrees, that stuff is dead. I told you we froze at least 15 times, still green and growing. You create a microclimate when your soil health improves. When we all came in this room this morning, it was a little cooler. Now we've been here a while, it's heating up, right? What happens in the soil? It's more microorganisms a teaspoonful of healthy soil than there are people on this world. Same things happening beneath our feet on soil. You have healthy soil, that biology is going to heat up. What I'm really doing is optimizing solar energy collection with these diverse mixes. If we have a monoculture out there, how much sunlight is going to be collected? Now you look at this photo, this very diverse mix, all those different leaf sizes and shapes. The more sunlight that I can catch with those leaves, the more photosynthesis that's going to take place, the more carbon I'm going to pump into the soil to feed biology. We're increasing photosynthetic capacity. Now, as your soil health improves, you'll also increase photosynthetic rate. In other words, the speed at which this takes place. So, how are we able to get massive amounts of carbon out of the atmosphere into the soil? This is one of the keys. It's with photosynthesis. More photosynthesis, the more liquid carbon. That's how natural systems function. CO2, photosynthesis, root exudates, biology, plants. That's my whole life right there, Monty. We could, my, the whole key to my success is right there. This isn't rocket science. It's simply the efficiencies of nature. Now, we've heard a lot about cover crops, and I like to think of cover crops. Use them for what you don't have. What's your resource concern? I get a lot of calls and emails about cover crops. People always say, Gabe, what cover crop should I plant? And I answer them this way. I didn't choose your spouse. I'm not going to choose your cover crop. What's your resource concern? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to improve infiltration? Are you trying to increase organic matter? Do you have salinity issues? Are you trying to feed... Livestock, trying to feed wildlife, what are you trying to do? Then we can design a cover crop mix. Is nitrogen your resource concern? Well, then we're going to plant some more legumes in the mix. 
Phosphorus, is that a concern? Well, seed buckwheat. Buckwheat secretes root exudates that help cycle phosphorus, make phosphorus available. Then we're going to start stacking different mixes, cowpea, millet, buckwheat. Look at all I got going on in just that simple three-way mix. We've got a grass, fibrous root system, proliferating mycorrhizal fungi, cycling phosphorus. We got, we got a legume, cowpeas, that, that's cycling nitrogen. Then we have buckwheat making phosphorus available. Very, very simple mix, yet it's performing several functions. That's how nature functions. We just have to take advantage of this. I showed you cow peas and sedan grass. Here's one of the earlier warm season mix. Every single species in that mix is there for a reason. And there's certain things it does better than others. That's what a diverse mix of seed looks like. People always ask, oh, how do you seed different seed sizes, shape? Put it in the drill, open it up so the biggest seed can flow through, put it on middle notch and go. It really isn't rocket science. Get it in the ground. This is one of the mixes that I commonly use on my operation. Would I recommend it on yours? I don't know. The only way you'll know is by trying it. You know, my son and I have a saying on our ranch, we want to fail at several things every year. If we don't fail, we're not trying enough. I have literally tried hundreds of different cover crop species. I will try them for at least two years. If they fail me two years in a row, I usually don't try them a third. If they, if they work well, I'll increase the amount of them each year, depending on my resource concern. But we design these mixes based on specific fields. And it, once you get in it and understand how these different species function, whether they will or will not work on your operation, this becomes relatively easy. The problem we have in agriculture is most people want a recipe card. They want somebody to tell them what to plant, at what time, how much, when, and they don't want to worry about it. Regenerative agriculture is not that way. The biggest difficulty I have when I consult with clients is teaching them to use their eyes, their senses. What are your fields trying to tell you? What's the biology trying to tell you? What does that soil structure look like? I can honestly tell you that I have spent 1,000 times more in my neighbor's field looking at his soils than he has. Now, I always do it when I have somebody like Monty with me, right? Show the difference, you know? The that gets a little odd look from the neighbor when he comes and I'm in his field. But fact of the matter is most producers have lost the ability to observe. They don't observe their own soils. Fifth principle is animal impact. I don't care what ecosystem you, you're in, there's always animals in a healthy ecosystem. Now by animals I mean insects also. You know, our native prairies, those deep prairie soils were formed with herds of grazing bison being pushed across by the predators constantly moving. They would graze. When a plant is grazed, that plant then starts sloughing off root exudates so it can attract the biology to get the nutrients it needs to regrow. So we're going to be able to heal soils faster, grow soil faster, if we integrate livestock. Now, does that mean we have to? No, but it's kind of like climbing the stairs. How many of these principles you apply will determine how high you go up that staircase. So when applicable and when we can, we're going to integrate livestock into the system. This is an aerial photo of a feedlot. Okay, really makes you want to eat beef, right? When livestock earn a lot, you cannot address resource concerns. You can only make them. And I know I step on a lot of toes when I say that, but it's true. Realize, for 26 years I was in the registered business. I raised bulls, fed them grain, had a bull sale, made money at it. But once your mind starts going down this regenerative path, you realize that wasn't the intent God had for those animals. I'm going to benefit my resource more if those animals are out grazing. And so that's why we've gone down the path, as I'll explain coming up, the next session to the grass finish business. Now we're integrating the livestock onto the cropland as much as we can. That is a huge benefit to the health of our soils. 
And there's other ways to integrate livestock, not just integrate animals, not just livestock, but also all the wildlife. As Monty told you, our ranch is located in the city of Bismarck's jurisdiction. So I got 100,000 people right around the ranch, roads on three sides. The amount of wildlife on our operation is absolutely phenomenal. And they're drawn there because of the healthy soil ecosystem. It's going to cycle the nutrients they need. Now, not only animals, but insects also. And I was excited to see Dr. Jonathan Lundgren on the agenda for today and tomorrow. Dr. Lundgren helped me realize the importance insects have in an ecosystem. Up until that time, I was always looking at insects as a pest. You know, you're trying to kill something, right? Well, if I see a pest, I'm going to try and kill it. Lady beetles are ferocious predators. We want them on our operation. This is a photo my son took. Look at this. How many flies are going to get through that maze of spider webs? Dr. Lundgren told me for every insect species that's a pest, there's approximately 1,700 that are beneficial. So why do I want to spend my time killing that pest? I should be spending my time providing a home for the beneficials. I can honestly say I have spent zero time the last 20 years worried about pests on our operation. The reason people have a problem with pests is because they don't have a home for all these predator insects. I haven't used an insecticide since before the turn of the century with the exception of seed treatment on corn, and we discontinued that in 2010 once I found out how lethal it was to soil biology. I would rather spend my time trying to work with life than work with death. Took this photo here in the Central Valley in November. I, I tease people, that's the idea of a California pollinator strip right there. Huh? <laughs> what kind of home is there there for beneficials? How are you going to have the pollinators which are required to pollinate our crops? How are you going to have the predator insects? Where are they going to live in something like this? Every operation we consult on, one of the first things we do is find areas on that farm or ranch where we're able to specifically focus on being what we call pollinator habitat. Where's the home for the pollinator and predator insects? They play such a key to our profitability and to a healthy ecosystem as a whole. We need to have them as a major focus. Okay, here's a photo we took when we were here in California. Three different soils. The lights, it doesn't show up uh, here with the lights on, but Okay, one of these pictures is from a very tilled field. One is from a field that has some tillage but also cover crops integrated. And then the third is just from a border area of that field. That's the same soils. All three of these were taken within 100 feet of each other. Same soil type. The only difference is the stewardship. And, whoops, in the case of this top one, it was lack thereof. It was nature healing this. My partners and I have a client who has 100,000 irrigated acres. They hired us because a large amount of those irrigated acres now are becoming unusable. Why? Because this is happening. Salts are accumulating. They're pumping so much water on there, the salts are accumulating. They're hauling off the biomass to go to feed dairies and feedlots, and their soils have gone from this down to like this. It's stewardship, people. It's all about our management decisions that change what type of soils we have, that change what type of, of plants we grow. That, and as I'll explain this afternoon, that also changed the nutrient density of those products. One cannot have ecological integrity without human integrity. And unfortunately, in the production agriculture today, I hate to say it, and I'm a capitalist, as you'll see in the next presentation. I'm not embarrassed to make money, and I enjoy making money. But I'm not going to do it at the expense of the resource. I'm not going to do it at the expense of the next generation. We have to think of our farm or ranch as an ecosystem, because that's what it is. So often in production agriculture today, we look at only one field. How can I gross the most dollars, get the highest yield off that particular field? But what does that 
play in the whole ecosystem. What effect does that have? Every decision we make on our operation has compounding or cascading effects, either positive or negative. Every single thing we do as a farmer or rancher is going to affect multiple things. Every time you make a decision, whether it be to apply a herbicide, apply a pesticide, apply a fungicide, do a tillage pass, is does that going to have positive or negative compounding and cascading effects? We all need to look in the mirror. You know, it was very, very humbling for me as I went down this path. And I thank God every day he put me through those four years. Because he taught me. That opened my eyes. I had to look at things differently. What effect does my management decisions have on the ecosystem? So, here are four operations. Left-hand column is stewardship. These are pounds, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. WEOC stands for Water Extractable Organic Carbon. That's the food that biology eats. Monty's business is based on giving producers value. The best thing we can do to determine value for our producers is to look at things like WEOC, water extractable organic carbon. That's the food that biology eats. How do we know how much nutrients are going to be cycled in our soil ecosystem? We have to look at that. So here is four operations. The first operations uses a lot of tillage. They've got really good diversity in their crop rotation. They grow sunflowers and flax and spring wheat, winter wheat, peas, oats, barley, dry edible beans, alfalfa. Diverse operation, they use no synthetics. They do use organic forms of fertility. Next operation is a no-till operation with low diversity. That person, for 30 plus years, all they grew was spring wheat and flax. Just switched them. If it was spring wheat one year on a field, it was going to be flax the next. Now the last two years, they have added soybeans. Third operation, no-till for over 20 years. They grow corn, sunflowers, malting barley, some spring wheat, soybeans, but high, high use of synthetic fertility. High use. Fertilizer, fungicides, pesticides, stack trait crops, it's all on there. The fourth operation on the bottom is mine. No till since 94. High diversity of different cash and cover crops. Uh, zero synthetics since 2008. And we integrate livestock. This is pounds of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Isn't it amazing, those top three operations? There really is not a lick of difference between these, hardly. Right? And then you get to mine. Now, I haven't added anything here since 2008. How is that possible? I've grown a cash crop on those fields every year. For years, people told me, Gabe, you can, you can cycle nitrogen by planting legumes, but you're going to run out of phosphorus and potassium. Really? No, I'm not. When I mine it all the way to China, maybe. I'm not going to run out as long as I have the diverse, the diverse plant species there and have the biology to cycle nutrients. I will guarantee you, you give me management of any of these three other operations, and within 10 years at the max, probably a lot less than that, I'll have those levels here right to there. For you see, those and their neighbors, I might as well say it, they're neighboring operations of mine. They have every bit as much nutrients as I do, just it's not available because they don't have the biology to cycle it. They don't have the diversity of living plants, and they certainly don't have the biology. Water extractable organic carbon, look at that. I have five times more food the day that this test was taken for my biology than they do for theirs, and that's the key. That's the key. Now let's look at what else. Percent organic matter. Remember I told you how when we bought that operation we were at 1.7 to 1.9 percent? Isn't that amazing? That's right where these three operations are. Now today we're anywhere from 5.3 to 11.1 percent, but we averaged 6.9 on the field that was tested. Infiltration, inches per hour. 
Remember how I said I was at a half an inch per hour? Isn't that amazing? That's right where the neighbors are. Now we're well over 30 inches an hour. It's all stewardship. It's all management. The head of Ward Labs, Soils Department, drove up in May because he didn't believe the soil samples I was sending him. That's my soil. This is him standing there holding this. This is my soil. Here's the neighbors right across the road. Same soil types, different management. We can change things. This is my cropland field. This is a neighbor's perennial pasture. Okay, which has more carbon in it? Which is going to cycle more nutrients? Which is going to produce more above ground biomass? Which is going to infiltrate more water, store more water? Stewardship, stewardship, stewardship. This is Dr. John Norman. I don't know how many people know him. He's a, he's a genius. He's got like, I don't know, five or seven different doctorate degrees. He designed a lot of the instrumentation NASA uses to read plant biomass on Earth from space. Standing next to him, that's Shannon Gome. Shannon owns Cedar Basin Consulting. I'm part of a project with Landstream where they're documenting now what I've been able to do on our operation. Shannon came and he pulled over 140 different soil cores off 529 acres, all picked through a computer program where to take the soil samples. So everything was uh, uh, random. So there's no uh, man-made uh, prejudice or bias in there. What this shows, this is actually a video. I'm not going to uh, play it. But this is a 48-inch soil sample. Here's what Dr. Norman is finding on our place. Well, he's talking about it here. Results from over 140 soil tests, 48 inches deep, show that we now have 92 tons of carbon per acre in our soils. And carbon is a cycle. It has to cycle through. That's the equivalent of over 60,000 tons of thermal coal per acre. Soil cores showed aggregation down to 48 inches. A horizon topsoil was down to 29 inches in places. I'm not saying over that entire 529, but in a lot of places. Neighbor sample showed a horizon of 5 inches. Can we grow topsoil? Absolutely. And we can do it much faster than people used to think possible. Here's what 20 plus years of regenerative ag look like in a soil. And the beauty of it is we can take soil anywhere in the world where there's production agriculture and get it to there over time. When I started back in 1991, we only had three to four inches of topsoil. Then we started going no-till. Then we started to diversify the cash crops. Remember I talked about adding corn and peas. Then we started to add cover crops. Then we went to multi-species covers. Then we started integrating livestock. What we have now, this is a soil sample there that is 11.1% organic matter. Now, that's not all my fields, but we're getting there. We're getting there. What you have on your operation is totally up to you. And I'm not here to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. Only you know that. But what I do know for a fact is the productivity and profitability of your operation relies and is based entirely on you.